Now let's have a quick look at cloud-based Jupyter Notebook provided by Google. That is Google Colab. Search Colab and hit the link. First, you would find an introduction to Colab page and resources available to you to get you ready with machine learning, data science and other usage of Python. All you need is a Google ID. Log into your ID and that's it. Create new notebook. So this is the editor ready to code. On your left, you will have a table of content explain what is in this notebook page. On top, you have an option to write either code or a text. We write code in a cell and to see the result of the code, we use play button on the left. We can also write text using text cell and use markdown to make our document look more like a professional report. We can change look and feel of the notebook using themes by going into tools, settings, site, themes and choose your desired theme. We can learn keyboard shortcuts used in the default setting by going into tools, settings, keyboard shortcuts or if you like you can create some of your own. We can also change the font size by going again into tools, settings, editor and select font size that you prefer. I prefer font size 16 for clear screen recording so I'm going back to the same font size. We have some more options in file menu such as create new notebook, upload notebook, save and also print and if you like you can create a professional PDF report of your notebook with the text and code results. Print as PDF and select a location in your disk. You have some other options for individual sale on your right such as delete the sale or move up or down the sale position. If for any reason if you don't want to use Google Colab you can always use original Jupyter notebook from their website. Go to the site and click the link try in your browser. As notebook can be used for many other languages you can select Python. Depending upon your internet speed it will load the notebook so wait for a few seconds. Once you see a welcome page create a new notebook from file menu and you are ready to code. Data can be organized and presented in various ways. In IT it is called structure of the data. Now structure depend upon the nature of the data that we are dealing with. There are three types of data structure at the moment. Structured data, unstructured data, semi-structured data. We are familiar to see data in Excel like this. Nice rows and columns with columns heading at the top and rows heading at sides. This type of data is called structured data where data is nicely organized in rows and columns. This is a very common form of structure that we see in our ERPs, CRMs, payroll system, accounting books, etc. The second form of data is called unstructured data, where there are no headings, no columns. Examples are Twitter tweets, Facebook posts, raw text, even audio, video, images. You can see that there is no predefined data model or data is not organized in a predefined manner. There are various beliefs that the majority of world's data in this form. Some say more than 80 to 90 percent of the world's data is believed to be in this format. Some say 70 to 80 percent. Regardless of percentage, one thing is for sure that this is the largest part of world's data. Now let's talk about the third form of data structure which is known as semi-structured where data is not nicely organized as in structured form of data or not completely unorganized as in unstructured data. Let me show you this by an example and this example is of a web page which is written in HTML. Here is an example website simplesite.com. And here is its HTML code. Now, HTML language follows a structure 
where the web page is divided into sections. Each section starts with its name and finishes that section with the same name. Start and opening names are called tags. Here is the first tag in this HTML web page, the HTML tag. It's telling the web browser that this is an HTML web page. Within that HTML, there are further divisions. Head section, body section, each section start with its name and close that section with the same name. So you have just experienced, though the data is not organized in rows and columns, but there is some manner, some rules this HTML page has followed. Other example of semi-structured data is JSON format, which follows the rules of the key value pair. Here is W3 schools example. This is key and this is its value. Key is the name and value is John. Now the question is why it is important to learn all three types of data formats. For the first one that is structured data, you may already be dealing with this type of data. But for the others two, the reason is most financial data on web servers are in JSON formats. Let me show you an example of Apple stock. These are keys and these are their values. Here are a few examples where unstructured data used for analysis. Extraction of emotions from customer feedback, Twitter tweets, Facebook posts, image recognition. An example of this is where handwritten postcodes numbers recognized by post office system to sort the mails. New product recommendation based on customers previous selections. This is what Netflix is doing. Programming language cannot start without explaining variables. These are very fundamental building block of any programming language. Variables like boxes. You put something in it and you give a name or labels so that you know what is in the box. And if you like, you can change the contents in the box. That is why it's called variable. So you can change the contents. Let me show you few examples. Let's create a variable that is store a sentence. Python is a great programming language. This is the content we want to store and let's name it x. You can name it anything you want but the variable name should be that makes some sense of its contents. This is how we create a variable. x which is the name of the variable is on left side of the equal sign and the content on the right side. Writing is not enough. We have to execute this command to let computer know that we want to store this content into a variable name x. In notebooks, we execute this command either by pressing play button or shift plus enter. Now the variable is created. Let's check what is stored in x. This is x. And this is how I run this cell to find out what is in X. Python is a great programming language. So this is as per our expectation. X is showing the sentence. Now let's reassign the X to a number 5. Like this. And run. Let's check what is stored in X this time. Number 5. So the value of X changed from a sentence to a number 5. Now let's do some maths. This time, I am multiplying two numbers, 3 and 5, and saving the results in variable x. Let's check. x is showing number 5, which is incorrect. The reason is, Python is a case-sensitive language. To save the results of multiplication, I used capital X this time, which is different from the small x I used previously. The small x is correctly showing the last value it is stored. Now you might be thinking how creating a variable is doing any good. We are the ones who are creating the content, storing it into a variable and then retrieving the same content. Why this hassle of doing the same thing long way? You will experience how useful the variables are 
in upcoming lectures.